Well, good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us for tonight's Science Cafe. Um, my name is Pip. I work in the development team um, at the MDIBL. And tonight we've got some really great speakers, Nisha, Jason Dara, and Emily Craig, both from the University of Maine. And they're going to talk to us about global water struggle and what, what might be coming for us. So obviously water is a key part to life, but also for, for farming and agriculture, it's, it's shaped the way that the world has become. But modern agriculture looks very different to what it used to look like in agrarian society hundreds of years ago in that we have massive, um, you know, monocropping and we're, we've got heavy use of um, agrochemicals in our production. And that, of course, leads to some um, environmental elements that we need to be concerned about and thinking about. So Nishad and Emily are going to share with us tonight about their research in Sri Lanka, which is a small island nation over by India. So Nisha, we're very happy to have him back because he's an alum of MDIBL. His undergraduate degree was done at COA um, and then he went on to both Stanford and Duke and he's now back at the University of Maine in Orono um, as an assistant professor. Um, and Emily is one of the students who works alongside Nisha and she is a Fulbright scholar. So they've been looking at an, a mystery illness in Sri Lanka where um, kidney problems have cropped up. And, you know, the thought is that perhaps it's in their drinking water, but the drinking water mostly shows um, that the levels are considered within safe for the, for the loading of agrochemicals that are in them. So they've kind of been on this mystery hunt to figure out um, what this mystery illness is being caused by. But as part of that, basically, it's giving us a glimpse to what, what the future struggles um, of global water might look like. So without further ado, Nisha and Emily, we're so grateful to have you here tonight to talk about your fascinating research. Um, Emily, I'm looking really forward to seeing some of your photos from in the field. Um, and Nisha, I think what you study is a really interesting nexus that's going to become more and more important for public health, um, for environmental health. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Um, I hope everybody can hear us okay. And uh, uh, thank you, Pip, uh, for the uh, kind introduction and uh, also to you and Emily for uh, the very kind invitation uh, to, to both myself and to Emily Craig uh, to be here. Um, and also this, uh, this opportunity to highlight uh, what I think is a really important um, global health concern that, that we and many others have been working on, uh, which focuses on, as you mentioned, uh, as Pip mentioned, um, on a kidney disease epidemic um, and its likely links to uh, access to clean water. Uh, so before uh, we get started with the, with the rest of the talk, um, I want to say that uh, it's, it's very exciting and um, always an honor to, uh, to address the community that, uh, that supports and uh, values MDIBL. Um, uh, because, because of uh, the platform that MDIBL uh, provides to, to many students, um, uh, including uh, myself, uh, this is a picture um, that I found recently from uh, when I was a Davis Scholar at College of the Atlantic uh, and I took a class, a uh, molecular biology short course here at MDIBL um, and had the opportunity to be mentored by um, late Dr. David Toll, uh, who was an incredibly um, inspiring teacher and I think half the class uh, went on to pursue uh, PhDs in natural sciences after this class. Um, and I was very fortunate to continue to work with him for several more years. And I think he certainly gave me the, the, the tools that I continue to use uh, today in, in all of this work that I'm doing. So I'm highly appreciative of, of the platform that, that MDIBL and especially David um, has provided uh, very early in, in my career to, to study the environment um, around us and how it's changing around us. And I think, um, that is an interest. Uh, learn, wanting to learn more about how the environment is changing around us is an interest I think that started um, a long time ago as a, a little kid growing up in Sri Lanka, um, where I was uh, born and raised. Um, I think Pip mentioned it's a small island off the coast of India, in case you don't know uh, where it is, I just put a, put a map of it. Um, and growing up, uh, my playground was, was a little creek that um, looked like this one. It's not this one, uh, which was right behind my house. Uh, it was full of life, um, lots of fish, uh, birds and snakes and uh, lizards that came to eat, this, eat those fish. Um, and I spent a lot of time there, but, but over time there was more development. And this is what that creek looks like now. 
Um, and also in the late 80s, uh, pesticide use became highly prevalent. And farmers who were uh, working in the paddy fields right next to this creek uh, obviously started using a lot of chemicals and started applying them to get better yields. Um, and, and with that, uh, all the fish populations started to disappear. And with that, all the life around that creek started to disappear. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with these types of scenarios, both at, at your own local scales and also at global scales. And, and seeing this change just as I was growing up, um, I think had a huge impact on what I wanted to do for, for the type of research that I do. And I think in many ways led down this path to, to explore the links between uh, changes in water quality, uh, the fish that are disappearing, uh, and the health and well-being of the people that are associated with those ecosystems, especially of those farmers. And I think all of these interests sort of came and formed a nexus with this work that we are doing now that I'm going to, that we are going to talk about today um, in addressing this, this very serious kidney disease epidemic um, that has affected several communities, uh, not only in Sri Lanka, but um, in a number of other countries around the world. Just to show you a map, and give you a little bit of a background on this. Um, over the last um, about 20 years or so, there has been an emergence of this um, kidney disease among farming communities in a number of tropical countries around the world. Um, we don't exactly know what's causing this disease and it's not associated with uh, your typical risk factors that are typically um, causing or, or uh, associated with chronic kidney disease, which are um, diabetes and, and hypertension, for example. So any of these communities, they don't really have those underlying factors. And because of that, it's been termed as um, chronic kidney disease of uncertain etiology or unknown etiology, CKDU. Um, and more than about 30 different communities around the world, uh, in Mesoamerica, Northern Africa, um, in, also uh, in Nigeria, as I just learned, and South Asia, um, and also in Southeast Asia, um, have been impacted by, by this disease. And we are just learning that um, there are emergences of, uh, emergence of these cases with uncertain etiologies of kidney disease also in the United States, uh, in parts of North Carolina and in, in Texas. So just to give you a brief background on what the numbers are like about this disease um, and, and tell you a bit about the CKDU burden around the world. According to all the current data, about 90% of the people affected by the disease are farmers or live in a community that is associated with farming. In Sri Lanka alone, there are about uh, 20,000 people who are currently at end stage renal failure. So in other words, if they don't get a kidney transplant, um, which very unlikely that they could get under the circumstances that they live in, um, that essentially becomes their, um, so, uh, the final cause uh, of, of their death. Um, and one community that, that we got to work in in India, uh, about 60% of the people have uh, failing kidneys. And in El Salvador and Nicaragua, the death rate from CKDU um, has gone up by about fivefold in the last 20 years. Uh, one community in Nicaragua, about one in three men um, has um, an end stage re a renal failure. And as I mentioned, a key characteristic is that it is not associated with diabetes or hypertension. And the people who are um, diagnosed with it experience rapid renal failure and die at a much younger age. Um, sometimes in their early 30s. So I think I want to note that, that these days we, we live in an um, unprecedented time with, with COVID. Uh, and, and in some ways, this kidney disease may seem a bit trivial uh, because it is localized to, to uh, only a few communities um, compared to a global scale event. But I think for these communities, um, it has been unprecedented for the last 20 years. Um, and we started working on, on this uh, project, on this research about um, four years ago. And just to introduce you to, to where we work in, in Sri Lanka, um, the first thing you notice when you go there um, is how serene and calm these areas, how these communities are. Uh, and, and you would never really think that about five to 20% of, of the people in, in this village that I'm showing are diagnosed with, with kidney failure that is likely to be their cause of death. And it's become so normal that um, everyone you speak with, um, especially in my first, first trip there, I was so surprised. They were very casual about um, how they would say, oh, someone in my family just died, or someone in my family 
has the disease. So they at least knew someone who's, um, who's got this disease. Um, and also in that trip, I was very lucky to meet um, this uh, person in the green shirt, um, Dr. Chamal Priyanta, uh, who's now become a key part of all of our studies. He was born in this, the same village. And to date, he's the only person to ever go to medical school from, from this village. And he's now back in the local hospital. And, and in that first trip, he mentioned to me that, that he's personally invested in figuring out um, what's causing the disease uh, because his own mother is, is diagnosed with it and is, is on dialysis. Um, and, and since that meeting in 2016, we've been involved in trying to identify the factors driving CKDU. Um, and some of the community members that I've shown here um, have become integral part of the work um, that we do there. And I want to spend the, the next few minutes describing what this disease is about and what we've been um, doing there. Um, so about 20 years of research has gone into this and we have some strong clues as to what might be driving it, although we don't know still the exact um, cause. And one prominent factor that um, that has been discussed widely, especially in, in South America, um, is heat stress and, and dehydration. Um, in fact, in, um, in that part of the region, CKDU has been dubbed as the first climate change disease because there's a, such a strong correlation between farmers who work in hot and dry regions in, in, those, in those areas, um, where temperatures has, um, have risen um, gradually over the last two decades. But the counter argument to, um, to this heat stress hypothesis that people are doing hard labor in hot and dry conditions all over the world, but the disease is not uh, prevalent all over the world, but only in these specific communities that I mentioned. Or perhaps we don't know yet the, the, the prevalence around the rest of, part of the world, uh, rest of the world. Um, on the other hand, um, given the disease is only common and, and is occurring in farming communities. Uh, there's been a, a role for agrochemicals that have been widely discussed and is considered uh, the primary driving factor in, in Sri Lanka and, and in India. Uh, but which chemical is doing this, uh, it remains a big question. And um, studies have proposed a role for uh, especially drinking water contamination, including hard water, um, high fluoride levels in, in their drinking water, uh, pesticides um, such as glyphosate that I think many of you may have um, seen um, or, or even used in your own uh, backyards, uh, which is the key, uh, glyphosate is the key ingredient in, um, in Roundup that's received a lot of attention. Um, and also heavy metals and metalloids, arsenic, cadmium, lead, um, they've received some attention uh, and they get added to these environments via fertilizer primarily. And they've been discussed as uh, and important players in, in this disease. But the key counter argument to chemical hypothesis or chemically driven CKDU is that um, agrochemicals are used all over the world, but the disease doesn't really occur everywhere. Um, and another counter argument as, as Pip mentioned is that in affected communities, these chemicals are found at levels that we currently consider safe under the current um, regulatory limits. So it looks like there is a multi um, factor, this is a multifactorial disease, or there are multiple players that might be driving this. And the disease may start early and it may get exacerbated over time with lifestyle, uh, lifestyle associated risk factors. Um, and in many ways, I think this is one of those perfect but unfortunate examples of um, two of our biggest impacts on the environment, environmental pollution and, and climate change. And that is culminating in, in a human disease. So, so for our work, we wanted to consider um, several attributes of this that, that haven't been considered previously. Uh, one is to look at the possibility that this is a chemical mixture effect, um, where each individual chemical might be at low levels, but in combination, they may have synergistic effects. Um, also, we know that most chemicals eventually filter through the kidney, so it's possible that if the total chemical burden is high, even though if individual compound is at a low level, um, especially in the drinking water, um, kidney, kidneys might be a target organ that may get damaged over time. Um, it's also possible that the, the disease has a, a developmental or childhood onset. Um, and right now, studies are only focusing on identifying risk factors in people with failing kidneys, but there's been very little attention on, on children and, and their kidney health. 
So to get at some of these, uh, we've been doing work in, in India and Sri Lanka, as I mentioned, but primarily in Sri Lanka for the last three years. Um, and, and we partner with a local um, university, University of Ruhuna, um, as well as um, we've set up a nonprofit institute, uh, theme institute to coordinate all of our field efforts. And just to orient you to where the disease is in Sri Lanka, um, you see that it's, um, in, in, if you look at this color map, um, when it's really dark, that those are the regions that are are significantly impacted by the disease and then there are some emerging areas. And we, uh, we do a lot of field work in these regions as well as some of the southern regions where we don't see the disease all that much. And Sri Lanka is a great um, sort of a, a case study on, for this because of the um, highly organized public health care system that they have which uh, results in a lot of documentation and people have access to, to medication uh, for other diseases that may have a, an interactive effect on this. Um, and also, uh, there's high literacy rate, uh, so there's a lot of public awareness about, about this disease as well. So another key feature of CKDU-impacted areas in Sri Lanka um, is that how the, the waterways are shaped. Um, what you see here in this, this picture, um, this is a 2,500 years old um, ancient irrigation system that essentially form the fundamental unit of, a, of the agrarian civilization um, in Sri Lanka at the time. And the two key components of this um, are uh, the big reservoir or the tank um, that provides water to the rice fields. And around that, the community was, was built. And, um, and the, the, these reservoirs, they capture water from the natural springs and also uh, they collect rainwater and, and store that water during, um, during the rain season and irrigate uh, rice fields throughout the year. And um, saturation of, this, uh, of these tanks also lead to saturation of the local water table, which help fill all the, the dug wells that uh, provide drinking water to the farmers. Um, and, the, and this water then would flow from the tank to the rice fields, irrigate the rice fields, and then it would feed into a secondary unit just like this, um, where the water, all the water would collect into a tank again, and then that would then feed another set of rice fields, and then this would continue in a cascade manner um, until all the water connects to a major river that then flows into the ocean. So the, the engineering skills that went into building something like this uh, is still quite puzzling, but you can see from all the blue dots around the country in this map, um, that there's a huge network of these types of cascades that were built to irrigate an entire region um, to produce enough food that sustained the whole country for um, about 2,000 plus years. But what happened in the last 30, 40 years is that, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, um, pesticide use became widespread, fertilizer use became widespread. And as you can imagine, whatever people added to these rice fields um, or these paddy fields would end up in this cascade system and would accumulate as they go downstream. And almost all the CKDU impacted villages are associated with these, uh, with these reservoir systems. And all of our work is, is really aimed at trying to understand um, the potential role of contaminants in these water systems that may contribute to, to CKDU. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do was to determine the chemical burden of, of drinking water. Um, we collected water and, and sediment samples from CKDU endemic regions um, shown in these orange arrows, um, as well as non-endemic non regions shown in these, these blue arrows. Um, and we collected samples from drinking water wells. A water well would look like this from the reservoirs that irrigate the rice fields, the rice fields themselves, as well as um, water purification units that have been set up to in the last 10 years or so to um, help communities to get clean water. Uh, and we then measured what's in that water. We measured inorganic constituents as well as organic constituents. And to highlight um, some of our key findings, um, this is data from our metal analysis. Um, this was done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Brian Jackson at, uh, at Dartmouth. And what you see here, uh, it's not all of our data, but a key um, representative sample of our data um, is the level of a given metal as a percent of um, its maximum allowable limit. So if it's in red, that means that chemical is more than um, almost the double the amount that's allowed. And dark blue means uh, that it's below the regulatory limit. 
And we found that every metal we looked at is below the current um, safety regulatory limits, except for vanadium. Um, interestingly, vanadium was never measured in these environments in any of the CKDU impacted regions around the world, uh, but it does have no nephrotoxic compounds. And uh, we may have a strong reason to believe um, that vanadium may be playing a really important role in this. Um, but another key thing we found was that the chemical mixture or the, the overall chemical composition in these regions are highly source dependent. Um, this graph might be a little hard to interpret right away, but essentially what it's showing us is that um, if you take the chemical signature of, of patients' um, wells or, or drinking water sources belong to patients, they cluster separately from the drinking water samples belonging to non-patients, but they cluster very differently from rice fields and reservoirs. Um, and then obviously there are differences between um, endemic versus non-endemic regions. So there seem to be a heterogeneous mixture of metals depending on where you get the water samples from. Um, and then water is, uh, metals are only one component of, of, the, of a water sample in terms of contaminants. We also wanted to look at um, the organic contaminant levels and we partnered with a team at Duke University to um, look at the organic chemical constituents using uh, what's called a non-targeted chemical analysis. Um, and what you see in this um, heat map figure is, um, is, all, is our results from that analysis where each row is, um, is, a, is a chemical. If it's in blue, that means that chemical is present at a higher level. If it's in, in orange or in red, rather, um, it's, it's present at a very low level or it's not there. Uh, P and NP represent patient versus non-patient wells. Um, overall, what we found was that um, drinking water sources, um, regardless of patient and patient um, conditions, uh, in this region is, is contaminated with surfactants, pharmaceuticals, uh, personal care products, but also notably um, pesticides. We identified about 25 different compounds with known, or rather 26, with known uh, nephrotoxic properties. Uh, so this data is really highlighting that what people are drinking is a complex mix mixture of chemicals that may have um, toxic effects uh, on, uh, on, the, on the kidney or perhaps even on other organs uh, that we may not have realized yet. So based on this, uh, the sort of having the, a unique chemical signature and also having complex mixtures, but also at low levels, um, this is confirming our idea that um, that there might be a role for synergistic effect for these chemical mixtures. And um, we wanted to know if the chemical mixtures or, or the environmental samples that we get from these regions, are they, can they actually affect the kidney? So we turned to um, saberfish as a model. And a common question that I always get is, do fish have kidneys? They do. Um, and, and they in fact, um, have become a prominent kidney disease and regeneration model, uh, and several um, folks at NDIBL are leading the field um, on this work. And we've been very lucky to be able to collaborate with uh, both uh, Dr. Ian Drummond and um, Herman Huller's lab, uh, especially uh, Pat Schroeder and, and um, Lynn Beverly Staggs, and uh, some of the work is still moving forward. But um, it's been very exciting to, to use um, the tools that's been developed in those labs to understand um, the toxicity or the nephrotoxicity of the water samples that we derive from these regions. Um, Saberfish are also a great toxicological model, um, in addition to being a great kidney disease and, and regeneration model, uh, because um, it allow, they allow us to look at um, early life effects as well as later life effects of exposure to multiple chemical mixtures because they breed in fairly large numbers, um, especially compared to mam mammalian models, we can um, conduct exposure studies in a relatively short time um, that spans the entire um, length of life. Um, and, and we can also visualize these, uh, these organisms during development to look to see if, if the both kidney function and structures are changing during development. So they're not only a good, uh, a, a good kidney disease model, they're also a high throughput um, toxicological model that we can bring together to understand uh, potential factors uh, or the contributing um, role of chemicals in these regions uh, that may play a role in CKDU. So what we did was um, we exposed developing zebrafish to drinking water samples um, and other environmental samples that we get from CKDU endemic regions and non-endemic regions. And we also created chemical mixtures back in the lab based on what we found 
to have in those um, in those water samples. And um, with our exposure studies, we looked at a number of endpoints, um, kidney, uh, genes involved in kidney development and injury, uh, functional changes, structural changes, uh, and, and changes in, um, in mitochondrial function, uh, which can tell us a little bit about the mechanisms of long-term toxicity. Sorry, I have structural changes uh, listed twice in there. Uh, and I'm not gonna show all this data, but I want to highlight sort of three key points that came out of these studies. Um, one is that we found that environmental samples can affect kidney development and can induce kidney injury, um, at least based on the gene expression data and the histology data that we have. Um, and it seems that the, this toxic effects or whatever these effects that we are seeing from these exposures um, seem to really depend on the type of mixture that we use. So some mixtures were much more toxic, while some mixtures actually were uh, recovering effects of toxicity when those compounds are at individual levels. Uh, we also found that the drinking water is toxic to the mitochondria, uh, which may tell us a uh, potential mechanism by which um, continuous exposure to these chemicals uh, may have, uh, may contribute to um, disease progression if someone is, is drinking that water for a long period of time. Um, so what this is telling us, especially this, uh, this one key point where we are seeing changes on, uh, on genes involved in kidney development, um, made us think about uh, what is, is this disease starting early in, in children uh, or younger adults in these regions? Uh, so we went back to the community to screen for kidney function um, in, in children. And that is something that, that I think has been ignored for too long in these areas. So, um, so we are still working through many of the protocols, both in terms of how do we do this work, but also what do we look for in terms of kidney dysfunction. Um, so we worked with a number of schools in four different areas of the country, uh, areas that already show um, significant effects of CKDU, um, significant prevalence of CKDU, as well as um, where CKDU is still an emerging concern. And we measured the microalbumin to creatinine ratio, so ACR, um, as a marker of kidney function across about 674 children uh, between the ages of 14 to 17. And in all four regions we looked at, we found that about 3% of the children in our survey already have compromised kidney function, uh, with some kids showing um, extremely poor kidney health. We also found that about 50% of the children have mildly elevated ACR values, which in the US um, would be ignored if those levels are measured in a child. Uh, but I think it's worth noting that, that um, they are living in, in regions that are seeing a, an epidemic of kidney diseases. So um, potential mild compromised kidney function early on may mean that they are potentially susceptible to other nephrotoxins or other risk factors such as heat stress later in life. Um, but it is already, I think it is concerning to see that already about 3% of the children showing these um, compromised ACR values. So with this, I think we have a strong um, reason to believe that there is a potential chemical origin and that it might be initiating this disease at an earlier age than what we previously thought, before other risk factors, uh, especially occupational risk factors, um, come into play. And broadly, I think this work is, um, and, and the CKDU epidemic, is highlighting, I think, a tremendous challenge, as Pip mentioned in the beginning, that we face in, in environmental health. Um, we all know that, that chemical mixtures are the most environmentally relevant chemical burden we experience. But it's a real challenge when it comes to deciphering um, their health impacts. And, and when you add the layer of um, assessing long-term impacts, uh, where disease may initiate early on in life and then continuous exposure through another 20, 30 years contribute to uh, the disease progression. Um, that plus the potential role for other climatic factors such as heat stress, I think it becomes, it, it does become a daunting challenge to really piece apart what is driving this type of disease. And, and that makes it incredibly difficult to implement any policy level um, changes. So I think it's, it's very clear that by the time we reach a scientific consensus on this, um, it might be way too late for some of these communities. Um, and I think while we look for 
answers for these communities, especially um, the, the children in these areas um, should not be drinking the type of water that, that they're drinking. So to that end, um, I've been um, working with two local schools uh, in two of the impacted communities to build water filtration units uh, to provide uh, clean water. But that does come with some caveats associated with it. For example, um, uh, female students in these regions, uh, in these schools, um, are reluctant to drink water in the school because the school facilities aren't optimal. So they would rather be dehydrated and go home to their well water that is potentially contaminated. Um, on the other hand, we found that some of the, as I mentioned earlier, some of the organic pesticides we, we tested are more toxic to the kidney on their own compared to when they're in mixture with the metal. So with the filters, what we are doing is we are removing the metal constituents of the water, of the water but um, the organics are still likely to be there. Uh, so there's some likelihood that, that we might be making this worse by filtering out the metals. Um, so, so I think in so many ways, our immediate goal is to try to increase awareness about um, water health and water contaminants in, in well water and um, to that end, we've, we've developed several citizen science projects um, led by especially one of the teachers in one of the schools. Um, and he works with a group of students to collect water samples from wells throughout the year um, and measures basic water quality parameters using um, equipment that we've provided to the school. So, um, and then that's become a great teaching opportunity um, as well as it gives us a sense of uh, how the, water, the, the drinking water in, in these drinking water wells might be changing throughout the year, um, especially during monsoon seasons and uh, non-monsoon or the drier, the drier seasons. Um, we are also working with the University of Runa to build um, a zebrafish research facility that uh, can then potentially be used for field studies. Um, and, and a lot of this work, um, I want to highlight that was funded by a um, number of philanthropic efforts, um, including the, the North Carolina Sri Lankan community who put together a concert to raise funds and they've they've raised funds to, lot of, to do a lot of these work with the schools in the last two to three years. And uh, this work, um, especially our zebrafish research um, capacity building efforts, uh, got a huge boost when um, Emily Craig, who's here with us today, uh, when she received um, a Fulbright Award to work with us uh, in Sri Lanka on this project. So now um, I'd like to turn the presentation over to her to share a little bit of um, her experience with you in working in, in, on this project um, in Sri Lanka. Over to you, Emily. Hi. Um, so my name is Emily. I graduated from the University of Maine's Honors College in 2018. Um, and I began working with Nishad in 2019 on the CKDU project, um, where I was fortunate enough to meet a visiting scholar named Delaney. She's in the picture right below right here. Um, and the two of us analyzed um, well water samples from Sri Lanka. And during this time, um, I was able to work with Nishad to develop a proposal for a Fulbright Fellowship. And I was very fortunate um, to be awarded the scholarship. So from November 2019 to March 2020, I was in Sri Lanka. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Um, so while I was in Sri Lanka, I worked with Professor Mangala da Silva from the University of Rahuna. Uh, he's in the top right of the clipboard, that's his face, and his lab team. And I got to continue to work with Delaney and meet a lot of other intelligent and driven students, Asini, Sakunta, and Samira. Um, before I left for Sri Lanka, I told you that I was working with water samples from uh, CKDU affected areas, but it wasn't until I actually got to Sri Lanka that I met the people whose water I was analyzing. Um, and the pictures on the slide um, depict a typical field visit. Um, and so this was a really, the bottom right, the bottom right hand side, you'll see a gentleman in a wheelchair. Um, and I just wanted to like point him out, especially because he, um, he's 21 and has a stage four kidney failure. Um, and that's in the CKDU endemic region. 
of Sri Lanka. And it was the first time that I kind of was able to put into context farming well water, pesticide use, and disease. Because when you're in a lab and you're so far removed from the country or from the actual source of the water, it's hard to fully understand what it is you're analyzing. Um, so it was really powerful for me just to even be there, um, to see where the water was coming from and see a patient um, that has been um, affected by the disease. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so Nishad mentioned previously um, screening kidney health in children in CKDU endemic regions. Um, I really enjoyed going to the schools and interacting with all the students. Um, they were really fascinated in what we were doing and you can see them kind of peering through the window in the top left hand corner. They're giggling and smiling. Um, they all had um, a universal sound for ew because we were working with urine samples and I thought that was funny. It was the same around the world. Um, yeah, and like also, Nishad kind of pointed this out too. Um, in the school, I was also made aware of just how complex like the issue of clean water, drinking water was just, you know, as he said, like students in these schools had access to clean water, but they wouldn't drink it. Um, because the restrooms weren't great and I was just comparing it to my own time in elementary school when all my classmates would like chug water so they could get out of class and they'd go to the bathroom five times a period um, so it was just it was a really unique like juxtaposition between um, an American school system and a Sri Lankan school system and just how you know I took for granted how like the access to clean water that I had. Uh, next slide. So at this point in time, I was in Sri Lanka about three months um, and I started to notice like a baseline shift in the United States' stance on clean water. Um, I read an NPR article that the federal government would no longer be responsible for protecting ephemeral bodies of water. Um, and these can included converted cropland, farming, watering ponds, and shallow wells. Um, and I just wanted to remind you that the water that we're studying for CKDU in Sri Lanka um, were not large navigable bodies of water. They're converted cropland, farming, watering ponds, and shallow wells. And so I was immersed in this community that is suffering from a disease that would greatly benefit from strict federal protection of water, while like in my home country, it seemed like they were throwing theirs away. Um, so it was very disheartening for me um, to experience. And um, sorry, no, you're okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was given this like really unique perspective because I grew up um, in southeastern Connecticut, not really thinking about drinking water. Um, and during my lifetime in Connecticut, there's really strict regulations on um, environmental pollutants. Um, and so I had clean drinking water and I had clean water to swim in. I had clean water to play in. It was never really a question. Um, and so I don't know what it's like personally to relax on these guidelines, these rules on ephemeral bodies of water, but being in Sri Lanka, like I kind of got to see the potential harm that like a shift in thinking can cause um, to ecosystem and human health. And having access to clean water is a basic human right and not a privilege. And so it's sad that even in the 21st century, we have to say that out loud. Thank you, um, everyone, and thanks, Emily. Um, and I'd like to obviously thank all the funding agencies that helped us do this work and many number of collaborators that um, has immensely helped, uh, have immensely helped um, pull this work forward and uh, everyone in the lab and uh, especially the uh, members of the community that we work in and and I think we both feel very lucky to be part of that community so uh, and and thank you uh, for everyone uh, for coming in and listening and happy to take any questions uh, from here on. Great well thanks Nishad and Emily that I mean 
thought provoking, um, an area that lives very different lives to what we live here um, in most parts of Maine. So um, probably good for us to think about, you know, before before the US gets to the stage or the rest of the world gets to the stage where these become global problems, how can we how can we work to not have these problems become truly global? Um, now, what's next for your research? Where do you go from here? Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question because it, this has opened up many different um, areas that, that need to be considered, um, especially the um, finding that there is potentially an early life or childhood onset for kidney diseases. Uh, and, and that is a major area, I think, that warrants not just in the CKDU um, impacted areas, but around the world that warrants attention because um, kidney disease is, of course, a, a huge um, health burden uh, affecting somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of the world population. So is there a role for um, chemical exposure that, that affects um, the susceptibility or, or the vulnerability of, of a um, of someone who already has diabetes, if they already are exposed to these types of chemicals, would they be more susceptible to uh, another systemic disease that might make it worse? So I think in general, there's, I think this is highlighting and, and, um, and warranting further research and understanding how, um, especially some of these low level chemical mixtures might be targeting the kidney, uh, making that those tissues or those organs more vulnerable to further damage or stress later in life. And that's definitely an area that I'd, I'd be very interested in, in pursuing. And then there's the other side of um, getting to the bottom of, of this disease where um, we're looking to, to integrate um, the toxicological assays using fish, epidemiological studies that we're doing with, with both children and adults, as well as um, the chemical analyses that we can do to better understand what is the actual chemical composition of a given water sample. How often does it change? What is the periodicity of, of a given chemical signature in these, in these regions? So there's a number of avenues that, that, that we would love to, to pursue uh, moving forward, not just, I think, in Sri Lanka, because the, the disease is becoming prevalent um, around the world, especially um, even in the United States. I think this is, um, this is highlighting something that, that I think we need to pay more attention to. Uh, is there anything you would like to add, Emily? Uh, no, I think you covered it. Yeah. Well, Emily, I have a question for you. Having now yeah. seen the human impact of the work that you, you do kind of, it's very different to sitting at, sitting in a lab at a bench. Um, has that changed your perspective on where you want your career to go? What comes next for you? Um, <laughs> the big question. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it, it has, um, it definitely, it definitely, ha I've, um, I don't know how to, put it. I guess I became way more fascinated with the kidney than I ever anticipated becoming, because um, my degree is in marine science, um, and, but the work that I've been doing is in more environmental toxicology, so it's kind of made a shift in that the work that I hope to continue to do in the future will have a strong a uh, human health component with the um, with the undertones of environmental health, um, but it definitely has shifted um, it from a strict marine science path to more of a human health and environmental health path. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Michaud. Can I can I ask you a question? Uh, how is the kidney disease diagnosed? You showed us data uh, with proteinuria in mm -hmm. uh, some of the children. Uh, is proteinuria the hallmark or is it uh, declining renal function? Yes, good, um, great question. And, and EGFR is sort of the hallmark right now. Um, it's been Deba highly debated, how do we diagnose this? Because by the time someone gets CKDU, it's usually stage four um, renal failure. So any of the markers that you're measuring could just be a result of what's been happening leading up to that point. 
And there's a lot of emphasis on trying to use markers like KIM-1 and NGAL as early diagnostic markers. And we've been doing some work um, trying to think about um, potentially uh, um, mitochondrial DNA damage markers in the urine as an early marker and that we can collect from urine samples. So there's a lot of effort that's going towards uh, looking for uh, diagnostic markers early on during the disease, but how do we identify those patients uh, or those folks who might be impacted early on is, is, a, is an ongoing concern unless you do a broad sweeping study of the entire community. Mm -hmm. um, because by the time right now, um, most patients, they come to the doctor and they say, my body hurts, I, I'm, I can't sleep and uh, they check the kidneys. It didn't used to be that they actually check the kidneys. Now they do right away. And then they find out they're stage four. Uh, within a few year or a few months, even they go into dialysis. Um, so there's rapid renal failure before it can get um, detected early on. So I think there's a huge space to really figure out a good diagnostic marker. Mm. Great, thank you. Um, we've, had a, we've had a viewer ask, is there a wide difference of contamination, contamination seasonally? Obviously, um, you know, Sri Lanka's tropical, subtropical. Um, do you, have you noticed if there's any difference between the rainy season and the dry season with the contamination levels? Um, yes, we, we have. Um, the, the concern is everything we, did, we look at is below the detection or below the regulatory limits. So there are subtle differences between seasons, uh, but if you put it into a, a larger scheme of metal data, for example, those changes don't mean much because that's, that's below the, 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 the regulatory limit. So uh, that's just a small change. So we don't actually know if there is any biological significance of that um, seasonal change, but um, we are seeing that the mixtures do have an impact. So there might be, um, we actually don't know that. It's a good question. Sure. Great. Um, now this one kind of ties back to your, to your earlier days on, on MDI at COA. You acknowledged David Tull as your mentor when you were an undergraduate. Um, can you share a bit about why having a mentor was so important to you? And has that experience um, influenced how you mentor your own students now? Absolutely. I think um, there are a number of factors that um, I, would, I would consider um, that would make a mentor extremely important. But I think the, the major, um, or if I were to sort of pin down one key um, reason was the, the level of personal guidance that you can get, not just in how, in how you do your science or how you, um, uh, how you present a paper or give a talk, but um, more sort of the, um, the overall broader career and, and, um, and perspective on life, I think, that, um, that you can get from a mentor. And, and I think David was uh, definitely a person who provided that. So I try my best to do that. I don't think I can ever get close to that, but um, it's, it's definitely a, um, You're doing good. Key, <laughs> uh, key um, factor to identify, I think, when you're when you're trying to work with someone. Um, Wonderful, thank you. Now we've got Denise LeBlanc. You're raising your hand. Do you want to ask? Um, you ask a question. Yeah, this is someone? this this is Dennis LeBlanc. This oh. is Denise LeBlanc. <laughs> Hi, hello, Nishad. Hi. Um, how are you? <laughs> good. Good. Um, I was wondering uh, what more you could tell us about the the uh, wells themselves and where they're located relative to the reservoirs mm -hmm. and has there been any consideration given to uh, redesigned wells like they're trying to do for example to deal with arsenic in Bangladesh? Great question and um, that is actually something that that we're very interested in mapping out um, just we haven't done that but the sort of um, I would say quote-unquote anecdotal um, approaches have shown us so far is all the patient wells are um, very close to their ice fields and all the non-patient wells are rather far away but there's no systematic analysis of that but I think it's a little bit more complex than that in terms of how the water table is 
um, set up in those areas. And we think that, um, that so for example, we, we know if the lake is full, the wells are full. Um, and it's not just the, lake, the, the well is collecting rainwater. Um, so there is definitely a direct transfer of, um, of material between the, the reservoirs and the wells and not every well gets full. So, um, so I think there's reason to believe that, that whatever that's getting added into the rice fields are um, getting into the, to the um, local water table and that's getting distributed around. Um, it would be great to do some kind of isotopic analysis to figure out how, how is that getting distributed. Um, there's been very little hydrological studies that are actually happening in, in these regions. Um, and I think something to, to really think about. Thank you. Um, one, one question I've had is, in Sri Lanka, how many patients have access to dialysis, given that these are rural communities? What, what are their medical options if they find out that they have kidney failure? Um, great question. And actually, in the last 10 years or so, the government's done an enormous amount of work to make sure that uh, people get um, people can have access to screening. So anyone, because there is um, such high level of awareness, for example, if you go to these regions, you'd see signs of have you checked your kidney lately or have you um, had your urine tested? Um, so, so there is a lot of effort for, for screening, um, as well as um, the government set up dialysis centers. Um, so people can um, get dialysis treatment, but the, 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 I think the biggest barrier to that um, is the socioeconomic concerns in terms of if you are a farmer and you're working um, basically five to seven days a week and taking a day off uh, to go get dialysis done and then also um, spending three more, four more days recovering from that is not necessarily something they can afford. So many people don't actually use um, that facility just because they don't want to deal with what they call blood, blood exchange. Um, some people, if they can afford it um, in terms of time, uh, they would do it, but it's, it's free. So it, it's not necessarily that the treatment itself is costing money, it's the time off from um, whatever the income that they generate uh, that they can't afford to do. Um, but I think overall, compared to um, some of the other CKD impacted countries, I think Sri Lanka has done a much better job in trying to increase awareness and trying to provide um, access to um, treatment. But as I mentioned um, earlier, it doesn't get diagnosed until very late. Um, and people even though they can go get tested, um, not many people do. So once they get diagnosed, there's also some taboo associated with those. So and so have kidney disease, um, that their crops might not be uh, around for next year. And so people don't necessarily want to announce that either. So there's um, reluctance to get diagnosed uh, from that perspective too. So it's, it's a bit more complex. Um, than just access or the availability of, of tests. Doug, can I, can I ask uh, another question? Mm -hmm. um, when you have told us that the disease is slowly creeping into the US so that we see it in uh, southern states, is this the same disease? Any idea why this is happening? Is it climate change or do you think it's uh, too much chemicals uh, as in Sri Lanka? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that is a great question in that there is a lot of debate over is what we are seeing in Sri Lanka and India is the same as what we're seeing in South America. And, um, and is it the same that's creeping up in, in the US now? Um, overall, the term of kidney disease of unknown etiology um, is defined based on the fact that it's not associated with the other risk factors. But what's causing it might, could very well be different reasons. Um, as I mentioned, heat stress um, is a big factor that um, almost, I would say more than um, 50 to 80% of, of the uh, epidemiological studies have pointed to that in South America um, as, as the driving factor. Whereas um, it hasn't been looked at very carefully in Sri Lanka, but um, because how um, erogenous the diseases in these impacted areas, um, you would have a community 
uh, where the, the prevalence is, let's say, 20%, and you drive about 500 meters, and then there's a whole community that they don't see the disease at all. But it's equally hot, and they're doing um, equal farm labor. So this is where I think how the water table is contaminated might be playing a role. So if you're already susceptible and you're working under hot conditions, you may get it. But is it the same etiology um, in the U.S. and in other parts of the world? We don't we don't really know. So any genetic analysis on these patients mm -hmm. about susceptibility? Yeah. So um, a group at at Harvard has just looked at some of the uh, patient samples. Um, I'm blanking on, on their name. I didn't send those samples, what our collaborator in Sri Lanka did. Um, and they didn't find any um, genetic correlation, but it was such a small sample size. Um, I, I wouldn't put a lot of um, emphasis on that yet. I think it's a really important, obviously, factor to consider. Um, one counterpoint to that is um, in Sri Lanka, a lot of these farmers in these regions um, they weren't there 50 years ago. They all lived in the in the south, and then the government um, instituted this uh, what they call the uh, green. I uh, uh, can't remember the word exactly in, uh, for it in English, but uh, they they brought a lot of people from the south and asked them to to um, establish themselves in where the diseases. So this is what we are. Uh, we're seeing is that first generation of those people that came from those other parts of the country that are living in here that are getting the disease. So if it's purely genetic, we would see a more um, equal distribution of it around the country, but we don't see that there. We're only seeing it in uh, these regions. And they would say, oh, my um, grandfather and, and his family still lives in this other town. Um, and they obviously, you never see that. So, but again, no one's really looked at systematically in terms of genetic susceptibility. And I know there are, there are efforts going in, in towards that, for sure. Great, thank you, Nishad. Um, unless there's any other questions from anyone, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you so much to you and Emily both for um, such a fascinating presentation. So again, Emily, um, we wish you all the best with your future studies and where okay. life might take you. Um, and Nishad as well. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity and uh, um, definitely look forward to keeping everybody posted about what we find. <laughs> Hopefully Thank it'll you. be in person next time. Great lectures both. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us tonight. <laughs>